Michael Yo Show starts now. 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 Thanks for watching the Michael Yo Show. Here is the deal. Rate, review, subscribe if you like the pod. Need your love. What a love. All the comments, all the five stars. Bring it on right now. Rate, review, subscribe. Also, michaelyo.com for all my tour dates. But inside the studio right now, man, I tell you, is one of the dudes that every comic loves in the game. Ian <laughs> Edwards, what's up, my man? What's up, fam? Dude, Good to uh, be here. <laughs> you know what? Your comedy special just dropped uh -huh. on Comedy Central. Right. Uh, tell everybody how they can see that first. Uh, go to Comedy Central, the website, .comedycentral.com, and you can just type in Bill Burr Presents Ian Talk uh, or my name, and it will just come up. You don't need a, to have a subscription or cable. It's there. It's probably also on demand right now, maybe on Amazon by now. So just, you know, just look for it, whatever type of service you got, and you could just check it out. Okay. How'd you team up with Bill Burr on uh, this? Did he come to you or did you go to him? Well, I was already preparing to do a special. I was going to shoot it with my own money. You know, I stopped like writing on shows and shit like that. So I got to put this material in the can before it gets stale and then try to find a buyer. And if it doesn't happen, fine. But at least like that moment of time is captured in a prime way. Gotcha. So that I can move on and come up with newer material. It kind of holds you back. Do you feel even for a season, because you write on several different TV shows, right. you've written on several, even for you doing stand-up, do you feel like once you have things that hit in mm -hmm. a club, you don't write as much because you know you can go up anytime? Yeah, it'll make you comfortable. Okay. Yeah, it'll make you comfortable and you know you can do go to a club, kill, have great shows. But, you know, now that I've shot the funeral, like the night of the special when it came out, and I said, shot the funeral. Like, which is what I was gonna say. Like, the night of the special came out, I did three sets, and people was like, "Didn't you? Didn't you want to go somewhere and watch the special?" I said, "Nah, tonight is the funeral for my old material." Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I can't use it again, and I need to work on new material. So when people see the special or hear that I'm in town and they come to see me, I don't want them to be like, "Oh, he wasn't that funny," because there's a growth period. When you come up with new material, you got to get each joke right the way the old material was. And people might not understand that they don't know what stage they're seeing you at. And, you know, I just want to get the process of getting the material perfect so, as soon as possible. So not that you because I, I, I hear a lot of different uh, comedians talk about it. Some people say. You know what? As long as you got some new material when you go out, right, combine right. with your old, you got you know you got to do what you got to do to mm -hmm. go on the road after yeah, the yeah. special. I get that. And then some people, like I was talking to, um, I believe it was who was Patton Oswalt. He mm -hmm. says after he shoots a special, he won't go out mm -hmm. until he has all new material. But you can do that when you're rich. You right, know what right, I mean? Right. When you're trying to pay bills, it's hard to do that to come right. up with like here's another hour after my special just dropped. Right, right, right. So like realistically, how much new material do you have right realistically, now? Realistically, so the special was taped in December of mm -hmm. last year. So Oh, so you've had time. So I've had so I knew when I did the special that was pretty much like I did a weekend in, in Arizona maybe in January or something like that where I did a lot of the old stuff because it didn't air until August 12th or something like yeah. that. But uh, but all that time doing spots in clubs, just working on it. So then it's like a slow like turnover of in with the new, out with the old. Yeah. And then you're, you're replacing. You're replacing stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And how long do you think it will take you to build another hour? By the end of the year. But I have a lot of new material now, like 30 minutes. And then there were jokes that I didn't use in the special. I cut out the special that nobody's seen on TV before. So you can use so then, those. So I have those, yeah. Okay, how much cutting did you do in the special? Uh, the special came out to like 50-something minutes. Uh -huh. So I cut like two good bits out. All right. Yeah, that's All like... Right. Five-ish minutes a piece. So you shot it yourself in December. Was no, I was gonna, I was gonna shoot it. Okay, my bad. I didn't okay. finish that. Yeah, and and then Burr got a deal with Comedy Central. With you know, he was with All Things Comedy and Al Magical. They have their own company, and he got a three special deal. And then he hit me up because we'd had a conversation about specials before, and he's like, "Hey man, I got these three specials. Do you want to be one of them?" And I was like, yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, like yeah. yeah, yeah. I pretended a little bit. So let me think about this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm not sure you're the right I'm person not sure for you're me, the Bill. Right person, Bill. Let me let me think about this. <laughs> And I hung up on him. And, uh, <laughs> and then called, called him right him back. back. Well, well I, I dialed him on the other line before I hung up. Got you. And got then, you. so he just picked up. Yeah. It's like a click over. Back yeah. in the day, like, yeah. call yeah. waited. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, so you, you were part of that. You went into it. Mm-hmm. Um, how'd you feel walking out of the special? Were you very happy with it? Yeah, I was happy with it. Okay. Yeah, I was happy with it. Like, we got it done. Like, you know, had a certain theme. It had a certain tone, and I think we accomplished everything that we wanted to accomplish. Uh-huh. And it's done in a TED Talk style. Yep. And uh, and uh, it was a little challenging getting everything coordinated with the monitor because that's not how I was doing the set in the clubs. But the night of the tape and everything came out fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I want to go back. Like, how'd you start in comedy? Like, where where were you born? Where you raised? What got you into oh, okay. comedy? I uh, was born in England and raised in Jamaica and came to New York when I was like 17. Okay. And then just as a like a, as a stranger in this country trying to find my way and figure things out, I used to, I had a job at this Burger King and I'm just like, I spent like my first few years in America just observing, trying to figure out a way how to jump into conversations and have something to give in the conversation and sometimes you just get stuck like it's almost like prepared me for being in a writer's room because you're trying to add on to a conversation that's going on and sometimes you lose confidence in the thoughts in your head and you're like ah, that, that that won't make any sense that's going to make me sound stupid you know what i mean so you don't say things and then somebody else says it and you're like shit i should have said s-. that yeah so then uh I, I went through a lot of that, and then there was this guy at Burger King. His name was. Uh, <laughs> that <just> sounds <laughs> like a joke already. I'm dead up. I used to work at Burger King. No, I love it. Yeah, and his name was Game Ellis, and we still friends to this day. And he was like just funny as shit. And I noticed every time I worked on the same shift as him, that shift just went fast, mm-hmm. and everybody like orbited around him. Like I'm at the back of the broiler, looking at Greg over by the, the Whopper side, like just killing it. And everybody's like, even the people who are, he's giving the orders, the food to, so that they can hand to the customers. They're like looking through the thing. The guy on fries is like turning to Greg. I was like, that's what I got to do. I got to tap into my funny side. Uh huh. And this life will be way more easier. And I started doing that just to socialize, just to learn how to, like, you know, it's a calculated way to just socialize, but because I had to figure it out, like, so on the sidelines of life. But did you know you were funny, though? Because I, I just remember. Or do you think everybody can tap in? Everybody has a funny side and they can tap into it if they believe that. Well, I was young and I remember in Jamaica, I had fun with my friends, but I was comfortable. I was relaxed. In America, I was not comfortable. I wasn't relaxed. You know, like you're you're here. Like me and you are black. Yes. We're different types of black. Like, yeah, very like, different. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So I'm, it's the first time I've ever been in a country where they labeled the a black as people black. weren't the same type of black people as me and where we didn't have things in common. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, so it wasn't even that easiness at, easiness at first of like getting to know people. You know, I like our differences would stand out. Yeah. So I, the only thing that could like cut through all that with any race was just humor. It's feel true. me? So then I was like, let me relax, tap into my funny side. It's like a m- massage when you're just, just thinking funny. You're all having fun. Everybody's having fun. And I just started like working on being funny that way. You, you, tr- you were working on your Greg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And how long did it take you to develop that? Uh, the moment I realized it, it just became easy. Just, I just was like, couldn't think of anything. Uh huh. You know what I mean? I just couldn't, I was just frozen. You know what I mean? So, so Burger King, you worked there. Right. What was the next, did you. The st- next step? Yeah. Go to comedy clubs in, or was there a Ruckers in between? <laughs> <laughs> no, no Ruckers. Okay. No okay. I don't know. No Ruckers was hilarious. Uh- <laughs> but, uh, so then while I'm at Burger King. I'm 
Now I'm the second funniest person at Burger King. I'm killing it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Greg ain't there. I'm headlining. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm headlining Burger King. People are orbiting. I'm cracking jokes. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this the is The fry it. guy's looking at <laughs> you fry now. guy's looking at me. <laughs> Yeah. Greg went to the bathroom. I'm diving in. <laughs> there you I'm go. doing my thing. You're doing your five I've been in between. Doing my five in between. <laughs> I'll bring back your headliner. Greg is back from the bathroom. Get back on the whoppers. All right, Greg. Thanks for the thanks for the time, brother. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it, it was like that, and uh, so then one day I'm taking orders on the drive-through window, and I'm just using that as my first microphone. I'm like clowning. I was always like, and there were some bad hacky jokes. I didn't know better. But back then, people was into that type of shit. Do you, do you remember one of them, you I, would say? I'd do it like an Indian accent, like dumb shit. Like okay, I got Shit you. I would never do now. Okay. You know? And just whatever. Like there was some good stuff, some bad stuff, you know, just being funny, just going at any, everything, you know, vomiting it all out, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then this took this guy's order. He drove around. To the window, I said, hey, man, did you just take my order? And I'm like, yeah. He said, yo, man, you're funny as shit. You should try comedy. And then the moment he said that, I was like, it was like a light bulb, light bulb, oh, shit moment. Like, he's right. And I never saw this guy again. Gave him his food. Don't know who he is, what he looks like if I ran into him today. It could be you or him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And yeah. he drove off. And I was like, from at that moment, I said, that's what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Wow. No turning back, yeah. From a Burger King drive through Yeah, from a Burger King drive through yeah. Wow, you so lucky Greg was in the bathroom. <laughs> I know, right? Because yeah, he could have been working that drive through <laughs> know, and they would have told him that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then you went up? or like then I started going to open, open mics. Open mics, okay. And I started like making a record, either in my head or after a conversation, what made people laugh when I said shit to them. Do you... That's, it's so interesting mm -hmm. how we look at real life so differently. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll be at a table having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Everybody laughs at what you said. Automatically, mm -hmm. it triggers, like, uh, a recorder. And I, oh, remember this. Yeah, remember this. Yeah, remember yeah. This. That's so crazy. Because we yeah. need material. And it, it worked in a group of people. That's, like, the first mic. So I was just micing people individually. <laughs> I was open micing people individually. Yeah, <laughs> talking, blah, 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 blah. Not trying on purpose to be... Funny, just but being myself. Something came up but or something came up, I was like, boom, you know. So I when did that. you realize you were funny on stage? Did you uh, crush the first time you were up? No, nah, I bombed hard, bro. Tell me about it. Uh, I'd been going to this open mic in called, uh, this, still there in Levittown, called Governors, right? Uh -huh. So I was going to Governors, checking out the mics. I watched like three mics, you know. And finally the day came for me to do my set. And when you go to the mics, you're watching off stage in the back of the room, just observing. And then the first time I went on stage, they called me up and I invited friends down from Bird King and shit. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is Greg there? Was he there? He might have been there. Might, okay. might have been. It was so embarrassing, I don't remember who was there. And I hope they I hope they forgot this night as much as I want them to. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So then I went on. And the first thing that was different from watching the mics was that the stage lights are so bright. They hit me. They froze me. Really? And I lost my sense of sight. And without that, like my whole system went into a panic. And it made me realize why cops shine their lights on you at night. Because it kind of freezes you and makes you defenseless. Like, I've never been blind before. And I had no idea the stage lights were that bright. And it threw me off. And then now I'm in front of people. They're staring up at me. I'm like stuttering through all these things that I thought I'd remembered. And I fucked them all up except the last joke I told right and it worked. And I was like, oh, if I can just stop being nervous and get used to these bright ass lights, <laughs> then I should be fine. So you get off stage. What do your friends say to you? I don't remember. I just know it wouldn't even matter. It's just how I felt. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And I took the glimmer of hope that. All right, you say the shit clear, people will laugh. So you took away something that was good. Yeah, yeah, I took okay. away something that was good. So then you start keep going through the. What was your big shot in New York? I guess you could say on stage. Like, did Gotham ever? There was like, what 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 was your first big club that you rocked it at? Where you were like, yeah, I got passed or. Well, well, governors, I was like a, open, they had open mics. Yeah, so I'd always go there. I remember the first time I ever killed was there. 
Okay. Right. And uh, but like, there's so many. I never really had a big, big break. It's all mini breaks yeah. that yeah, add into you. one thing. So once I was like watching all the comedy shows on TV, right? I'm watching them. I'm watching them. And I'm like, oh shit! Like none of the comics on Long Island are on these shows. It's all Manhattan comics. So I was like, I got to get into Manhattan. I got to get into a Manhattan club in order to get on these TV shows. So I had done this audition for the show in LA and I'd gotten a call back, but I didn't get it. And then the next year they had another audition. And, uh, was it a stand up show? It was like a, like a, it was a show, but I don't want to, tell this say the show okay for for but it, but i met a guy who managed like some real comics who were doing okay big, got you big and they were having another audition for the show the next year and they wanted me to perform so i said can you get me a spot at the boston comedy club where they have the audition again and that night i went to the boston comedy club and this time the audition was stand up before when i auditioned you had to do characters which I don't know how they thought I was funny enough to do characters. So this is SNL? Kind of like SNL. Kind of not. Okay. Yeah, kind of. So then I did the audition at the Boston Comedy Club. I did my set. Somehow, on a, it was a, just a magical night. Like, I think I got a standing O. The place wow. was just crazy. Uh-huh. And Barry Katz went on stage. I think, I don't know. I think he was still, he was managing, but he was still doing stand-up at the time. And he was like, Man, that was amazing. Then he calls me in his office and like I met him that next week and he wanted to manage me. And I was like, Yeah. And then there I was in now I was in my first club in Manhattan. And from there I branched out to the other clubs in Manhattan. And then that led to whenever there there, there was opportunities. And one of the opportunities was writing on a talk show in LA like years later. And, uh, and which I, talk show was that? It was Keenan Ivory Wayne's talk show. Okay. Yeah. So I got that job. You know what I mean? So there's just all like something happened and you wait, you keep doing your thing and something happened you do co- clubs and colleges and then just keep plugging away. But the main thing is stand up. That always, mm-hmm. that's the consistent thing, but right. then other things will come. Is it, do you find it harder writing for other people than yourself? No, nah, I just kind of have developed like a universal sense of humor and then you so that usually works in every situation I'm in. And then you take into consideration the person, but I don't put a lot of pressure on myself because to be exactly in the tone of their voice, because then they could just change the thing that you wrote into their voice. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. What's, what's the most, what's the TV show you got the most pleasure writing in so far? Uh, I mean, I'm sure all of them are great. A, no, well, not all of them were great. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going to lie like that. Can but. you say the worst one? Uh, where you just didn't feel let like. Let me see. I'll, I'll 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 tell you the ones I liked. Okay. And then I'll see if I come up with ones. Okay. That were yeah. Which ones you really challenging? Like? like the lyricist lounge show was just a lot of fun. Young bunch of rappers and actors and and you saw people in their infancy like Tracy Ellis Ross, Heather McDonald. Like when we shared an office together, and so that was one. Uh, then I had fun. On, damn, the Carmichael show had fun at Blackish, and uh, how long did you write on Blackish? Like a season. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, had fun on a. What a makes bunch that of shit. show work? Because it's still, I mean, it's they're branching out, grownish right. makes this. What makes that show work? Because it's Kenyon Barris's one thing. One thing I noticed about him that I notice about people who have successful shows is uh, he knew exactly what he wanted. Like one time, right? You know Chris Spencer? Yeah, of course. Yeah. One time he called me and Hugh Moore and a bunch of writers to meet up with Nick Cannon. And Nick Cannon had this idea for the show called Wildin' Out. So we were, he was going to go shoot the pilot down at the Comedy Union. And he wanted to get a bunch of writers together to discuss ideas about it. And when we throw ideas out, he's like, nah, not that because of this. Nah, not that because of this. Not that. And then Nick Cannon would Nick be Nick Cannon saying, would, okay. you know. And then I, I didn't, I wasn't like upset with him. I was like, this guy knows what he 
doesn't want it to be yes. and knows what he wants it to be. So he'll take an idea of what he wants it to be. But if it's not, then he knows. And I, and I was like, oh. And then that show became successful. And Kenya was like the same way. And then anybody who show, they just know the show. And the moment you ask them something, a question they never heard about their idea before, they have an answer. It just opens up. Like they know it's... Jeff Ross was like that. One time I worked with him on one of his shows. So people just know. People know what they want. Like you work with Rogan, you know exactly what he wants. He knows exactly what he wants. You know what I mean? Do you when you were writing on Blackish, because I, I love the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it I wonder t- why? Because <laughs> I'm kind of, blackish. Because you're you know? blackish. But yeah. but I, I I was wondering like when you're in the writer's room, because I'm fascinated about mm-hmm. this, you know, with sitcom and the works and all that. When you're in a writer's room, and you're just coming in, uh-huh. you know, is there a lot of pressure on you or do you not see it that way? Yeah, you feel a little pressure. Like it's always makes you feel better. It's just like a comedy show. So you're in, except you're in a room with a bunch of funny people and you'd want to say something to make them laugh from my perspective so that they can start trusting your sense of humor. Okay. So they're more open to your ideas. So for anyone like me, that's never been in a writer's mm-hmm. room, how does it work? You go in, mm-hmm. they're all talking about an episode. Mm-hmm. Is that right? First of all, you know, first, how does just, it all? Yeah. What's first in general, we're just introducing ourselves, talking about our lives and then it sl- slowly goes into the show. But then I, for me, for me to feel comfortable, like when I'm on stage for me to feel comfortable, I need to get the first laugh. So I need to get the first laugh about something, whether it has to do with the show or my life or just something in the news that we're talking about, just whatever. Uh-huh. It's just a regular conversation. So it's just like I'll just open mic them always. <laughs> open always, mic them. Always open mic them. Okay. You know what I mean? And get something in. Then I can relax. All right, all right, they think I'm funny. So now I'm comfortable to just do my job. Okay. Yeah. So y'all spit around ideas. Then... Someone comes in, here's the idea for the episode, and then y'all, do y'all write in groups? How's it work? Do, how many people write one episode? Or do they split you in teams? Well, they did it a bunch of different ways. So before they actually start shooting, there's a lot of time. So everybody's talking about their lives and their experiences, and Kenya has ideas, and Larry Wilmore was a showrunner at the time. So it's like, these are some of the topics. And then we all come in with topics. And then we look at the topics and, and we start messing around with different topics and ideas and themes. And then one of them or a few of them will start taking form and we'll write down a lot of notes for it to see gotcha. if we have like a whole story. And then we keep developing it over days or maybe weeks. And then you'll have like an outline for okay. an episode. And then, so that's called breaking the story. Mm-hmm. Then you pitch it to the network. Network have their notes. Ah. And then you re-break it based on their notes. And then it's pretty much ready to give to a writer to go off and write it. Okay. And then they write a draft, come back, we all read it, give our notes, then they go back off and rewrite that. How do you and take we, people's notes? Uh, better I, than I used to. Okay. You used it, to get mad about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're just young and you're insecure, so you think it's an insult to you. But it, no, nah, you're just, just trying to help you open up your mind in a way that you might not have as in regards to the, to the, to the episode. So how long ago did you move to LA? Uh, like 20 years ago. Okay. Yeah. And how, so did it take you a while to break into the LA scene or was it pretty automatic? Cause Cass was managing the LA comedy scene. Yeah. I, I when I first moved here, that's the thing. I kind of took a break from stand up, and I was writing more and then, I started doing, first I was doing comedy, then I kind of backed off from it for like five years, mm-hmm. kind of wasn't really doing it. it, was like, I'll just write and do shows occasionally, and then at some point, like in the early 2000s, like I was like, let me get into the store and the factory, so I made a concerted effort to get into the store and the factory, and then, because I, I realized too, I was getting writing jobs from being a stand-up. So I was like, I can't let the stand up slip. So then, you know, somebody at the factory or the store would get a show. They see me perform. They're like, want to write on my show. Gotcha. So it worked hand in hand. So did Mitzi, was Mitzi the one that passed you at the store? Yeah. What What do you remember most about Mitzi for yourself? Uh, 
The funny thing is, Mitzi had passed me at the store without me knowing years ago. I remember before I moved to LA, there was a showcase of New York comics at the comedy store and we all flew out. This management company in New York put it on. So we all flew out. And uh, so we all flew out and that night I went on third and the crowd was dead and it was kind of in the OR. And then I went in on stage, cursed out the crowd and they started laughing and did my routine and then I did really good. And then some lady came up to me and handed me her card and said, whenever you're back in L.A., hit me up. But I didn't realize that was Mitzi. I didn't know who the fuck Mitzi was. Oh, uh, yeah. So then when I did move to L.A. later on, I f- completely forgot about it. And it's only like later on when Mitzi, when I made that concerted effort to get back in the store in the early 2000s. And then I realized... I, the night I was passed, and even years after, I said, the lady who gave me that card, that was fucking Mitzi. I could have been, been a, regu- a regular at the goddamn comedy store. Did she remember she gave you that card? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, but I, but what happened was the night I got passed, I'd been coming there because they said, like, there was like four weeks in a row, they said, come, all right, and she'll be there, and she'll see you perform. I came, and she was never there, and... I said, let me go on anyway, just to get used to the stage. So when she is there, so I performed and I did really good those nights. And the night that she was there, I went on. I did my set to like nobody was laughing. Really? Dead up. Like it was just silent. And I got off. But by the time she passed me before I got off. So maybe she remembered or maybe she saw something. Okay. I was still professional. You could still hear the jokes. It was just like. A weird ass night in the OR. So it is sometimes the crowd. Uh, I don't, or you know, maybe it is sometimes a crowd. But then, it say it's sometimes a crowd, right? Okay. When you realize it's the crowd, are you gonna run an audible? Are you gonna do something to adapt to get them, or are you just gonna do your material and say it's the crowd, like? It is the crowd, but then it is you too it's because you, you can do still do something once you realize that. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So, how are you the most one of the most beloved people <laughs> in the industry? Is it because you just been around and you and people know you as a brilliant writer and a great comedian, or mm-hmm. like how, how does that happen? Because I see so many people. Mm-hmm. Like I don't hang out in the clubs. I'll be right. the first person to say that. I mean, why would you? You got this beautiful ass house. Yo, yeah. <laughs> Hang out here. Right? I don't yeah. hang out at the clubs. This is just a throwaway room. <laughs> <laughs> this is an extra room in your house. Turn to a podcast There studio. you go. Yeah. But I don't I don't hang out, but I've never heard anything mm-hmm. negative about you. Uh, you know it probably is some negative shit. But okay. Yeah. But like you're you're, you know, Rogan, you're mm-hmm. close with Burr, obviously. Yeah. You did your special. Mm-hmm. Like how how did those uh relationships develop? I just known them for so long. Like Rogan used to be moved to New York back when I got into the clubs in New York at the Boston. So we used to do sets there. We used to walk and talk and hang out in between sets until he moved to L.A. Burr, the same thing. We used to have, like, eat at the cellar after sets and just talk all night with Patrice and Keith Robinson and Norton and and people, Rich Voss and just everybody, just kick it and just, just known him for years, you know, and everybody – took their turn and took off and did their thing, you know? Wow. And yeah. you just kept in contact. Yes. Well, I guess kept in a- contact or just the comedy club is like a contact base. Cause you run into each other and talk and hang out and shit. Yeah. Do you like, what was the comedy store like? Because I know it went through, it wasn't as big right. and now it's on this huge resurgence. Mm-hmm. Can you explain to the people listening what it was like when it wasn't? on top of the game. What what was it like performing there? Like you'd still like some nights were still packed, but it was it was not as popping as it is right now. Right now it's thriving. Like before, you know, you'd still have you just didn't have the energy, it had like a darkness to it. You know, like 
it just doesn't have didn't have the feel yeah does it that it has now it's hard to to put it into words like now every night you go all three rooms are filled there's more than one show in each room and like the biggest celebrities and comics are stopping by there we had some of that like a fraction of that before uh-huh and you know just like any place shit is cyclical so the club has had its ups and downs, but it's definitely on the up right now. What's the biggest compliment from a celebrity you got that kind of blew you away? Because so many celebrities go through that club or just, mm-hmm. you know, just seeing your work or re- reading your work. Yeah, I, I don't even think a celebrities ever even really like other comics. Comics or somebody that's important to you. Right, right. Like here's a, here's a funny, funny one. Like the other night at the improv, I was on a show with Miss Pat. Yep. And I went on before her. And she's just like a real ass woman. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so after I did my set, she came up to me. And she's like, I want to make sure you have my number. And I have your number so that if my show gets picked up because she's about to shoot a pilot, I want you to be a part of it. So that's like a huge compliment. Absolutely. Like from somebody I think is just an avalanche of funny. You know what I mean? Yeah. So stuff like that. Yeah. How do you write your stuff? Like your stand-up material? Uh, Is it normal? Like, do you have a room? Do you journal a lot? What do you do? Conversations. Uh, like, I still open mic people. Yeah. Unintentionally yeah. <laughs> and intentionally. Uh, sometimes a topic or a thought will get in my head and I'll sit down and write it. Uh, I definitely listen to my sets now. And... What, what what has changed? Because I know a lot of comics do that as well. Mm-hmm. What has changed in you after starting to listen to your sets? Uh, I can tell if something's off, if something needs to be fixed, or something might open in my mind and give me an idea to add to that idea. You know, so sometimes I want to write before each show, but sometimes I get lazy and I don't get a chance to do that. Uh-huh. But if I'm driving to the club, if I play my set on the way there, a tag or two might come. So to me, to me, that's like free writing. That's free writing, yeah. You know, it's like I didn't have to sit there and bang my head against the wall for like an hour or two. Like I just listened to my set and like, oh shit, that's a tag. That's a, you know, a tag will come to my mind. Like when, when, I, when I'm on tour or I'm mm-hmm. doing weekends, I do most of my writings when I'm working yeah. on comedy. Like mm-hmm. I can't just wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to write a joke today. Right. But you're more topical. That kind of has to happen for you, right? Sometimes I'm more topical. It depends on, you know, what's going on. Yeah. Because I don't... Well, there's a lot lot of shit going on. Yeah, there's a lot of shit going on. Yeah. Yeah. I don't always do a lot of news stuff. Okay. But I try to make it more relatable to me in a way that's relatable to everybody else. Yeah. What do you... What do you... uh, What's got you hot in the news right now? Or what's kind of just blowing you away? Uh, The Trump presidency? No. Everybody's talking about that. So I did a joke about Trump on the special, but in a way that's different than everybody else was talking was about. Was that it. the March one? The March one. Oh, yeah, I love yeah, that yeah, joke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My favorite joke of yours that I heard is a spider. Oh, it's a spider. Oh, the, yeah, oh yeah. did you do that in the special? Yeah, but they we took it out. So you then took now it? I can oh, use man, it. That yeah. spider joke is yeah, so thanks. damn funny. <laughs> that is <laughs> yeah. oh my God. It's so fun. So so I mean what are you talking about in the news today? Like if you were to write like what, uh, what, I talk about like you know, a few months ago, that Michael Jackson documentary came out. So I have a bit about that. Okay. And then I was just in New York and I did this show for Comedy Central where they actually asked you to throw in some topical jokes. And they give you a list of things. And one of them was about Chris Cuomo. Okay. You know, like he's an Italian from a famous Italian family. And somebody like insulted him and caught it on camera and called him Fredo. <laughs> which has got to be one of the most creative insults I've ever heard in a while. You know, Fredo's like yeah. the worst character from The Godfather. Absolutely. And I won't do the whole joke here, uh-huh. but now I did it on the show and I've kept on doing it. I, I was in New York last week, so I did it. So I've kept on doing it and now it's a new bit. It's a new bit. That, okay. that, that subject matter is a new bit. Okay. That leads into other shit, yeah. And I know you're a big fan of soccer, too. Mm-hmm. Why do you love... Is it because? Because I was born in England. Okay. And it's their national sport. And raised in Jamaica, it's their yep. sport. And I just played it all my life. That's the first thing I ever wanted to be was a, a soccer player. Now, in America, 
Mm-hmm. You know, where I mean, it's starting to happen. People starting to like soccer. Uh-huh. But would you agree with this statement? Because I yes. grew up. Okay, great. Before you even say yes. Because I'm about to say, I'm about to say, would you say in America, uh-huh. the soccer players are our worst athletes? The ones that can play football, basketball, or uh, baseball? No, nah, I wouldn't say that. Because a lot of people say the reason why American soccer is not great is because our athletes go to other sports. See, I, I agree with that though. Because we don't we don't But I can't imagine six foot seven LeBron trying to play soccer. He's too tall for it. You know what I mean? Well, because everybody's sh- I mean, but like but like you know, the the thing I don't like is when people go, Well, yeah, they're better athletes. They can run the whole time. I'm yeah. like, Yeah, but if our athletes uh-huh. did that ever since they were a kid, that would be no problem too. What are you, you talking got, about for soccer? I'm talking about for soccer. You have wide receivers running four threes, uh-huh. four twos. Uh-huh. You can't tell that sounds me. sounds fast. I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> it's fast. It's fast. It's fast. Right. So I, I would imagine like if soccer, if we grew yeah. up with soccer being number one, I uh-huh. get I think America would dominate. Exactly. If, but I think we grow up and go, oh, you gotta play basketball, football, right. and baseball because soccer in America hasn't figured out how to make money with all these commercial breaks because you can't do that in soccer i mean you there's ways to do it now because they can put like chirons yeah and like you know they can run an ad at the top of the left hand side of the screen and they keep switching that ad and then there's ads along the side yeah of the field you know what i mean there's 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 ways to get it in but i mean there's it's definitely growing but the problem with soccer in america is that america didn't invent soccer (laughs) <laughs> that's the issue true yeah that's the issue because baseball is boring as shit oh my god yeah and so is golf yeah and i i, I doubt we created golf i don't think we even created golf but, yeah. but for some reason you all love it here yeah <sighs> i mean i like because it because you had, play because you had world-class golfers you know i think i think america needs to win something or get far in a competition and people, more people are coming on board, but even more will. Yeah, I think I think America. Yeah. I don't think America likes losing that shit and having the world beat them at something. So it's like that doesn't help either. Yeah, no, yeah. it's a bad look. Yeah, as it's they not a good say. look. Yeah, it's a really bad. Do you think the male soccer team should be paid, or the female should be paid the same as the? No. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Why? Because their sport doesn't generate as much as the male sport. You know what I mean? Like, okay. Like I can't get paid the same as Bill Burr because I don't gener- I can't walk into the improv like, hey man, I'm gonna do 45 minutes. Burr will do 45. Give me the same amount of, of money as Burr. Like not as many people are gonna come to see me as they're gonna come to see Burr. It would be ridiculous okay. for them to. Okay. Let me rephrase that. How about the U.S. Mm-hmm. women's soccer team and the U.S. men? Because that's women- what I mean. But no, they say the women make just as much as the men. They do. The, the The World Cup generates. The Women's for, World Cup generates as much as the well, male. Well, they the say World the Cup. female team generates more money. They, For instance, the male team is negative $4 million and the female team is up money. This is what I read. I don't know. But, I, but listen, would, listen, I just watched whoever, okay. the Women's World Cup. And I watched the Males World Cup a few years ago. And bars were, were filled and a lot of different bars were open. I don't think as many bars were open at that time in the morning for the Women's World Cup. I went to some games. They were packed. But, like, different but, countries but, going to see. Like, like I didn't just go to the American. Okay, you're not just talking about You're talking about worldwide if it generated yeah, the same yeah. amount of so, money. I mean, if they, listen, bottom line is if they generate as, if the Women's World Cup makes as much, generates as much money as the Men's World Cup, then they should. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if and if and if all right, if the female American players generate as much money in America or for for the world women's world cup as the men's, then yeah. Okay. But like I said, like I don't expect to get I don't expect a D League basketball player to get paid the same as the same a as, a, as a as a nba pro i got you yeah I, it's just fairness yeah okay so now uh what do you got coming up next because you get comedy central special just came out you right. can stream that you got some tour dates too, i got right? some tour dates so yeah, yeah where good. where is ian where edwards t- gonna be where is where is i gonna be at yeah <laughs> uh let me let, let me pull up my own goddamn thing if i can find it oh yeah no uh, worries man so uh, i'll be I guess 
this is going to air next week. Yeah. So I'll be at Helium in Buffalo next weekend. Very August nice. August 30th to September 1st. Uh, at the Winchester Bar in Lakewood, Ohio, September 18th. Uh, at Go Bananas, September 5th through 8th. That's in Cincinnati, Ohio, again. And the Press Box in Fresno, September 28th. And the, Fre- the Press Box in Clovis, California, September 28th. Same day, two different shows, two different venues, not far from each other. And uh, Helium in St. Louis, October 3rd through 5th. And uh, should I do all of these? Rosemont, Zanies. Do them, October man. October 11th there. through 12th. Is this too much? Uh, Rancho Cucamonga. Rancho. Rancho Cordova. Tommy T's, November 29th okay. through December 1st. And what's your website? In Edwards. Uh, in Edwards And all the dates are there. All yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, man, thank you so much right, for thanks. stopping by. My thanks, dude. My, my. I appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. For mm-hmm. my ticket information, just go to michaelyo.com. We'll see you next time.